Henry Kissinger said last year, a few months before he passed, that Japan is heading towards becoming a nuclear power in five years. Now, Kissinger was America's most consequential Secretary of State and the world's most experienced diplomat. He clearly knew what he was talking about. So why would he make such a statement? Please subscribe and let's find out why. This video is brought to you by my geopolitics course, Geopolitics from First Principles. The link is in the description below. So first of all, we have to understand and we have to keep this in mind that Japan has a very strong aversion to nuclear weapons for obvious reasons. They are the only nation against which nuclear weapons have been used. Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. John Foster Dulles once said that Japan has a nuclear allergy. But today the situation in the world and in the region around Japan could be such that Japan may have to move past that nuclear allergy and perhaps embrace the possibility of becoming a nuclear weapons power. So first of all, does Japan have the technological capability to do this? So Japan is the world's most advanced, most technologically advanced nation. It has a superb civilian nuclear program. It builds superb nuclear reactors. It has superb submarines. It is said that Japan's decommissioned submarines are better than most submarines serving in navies around the world today. That's how good Japan's submarines are. And the Chinese are really, really worried about Japan's submarine capabilities. So they have superb submarines. They also have an excellent space program. They build excellent rockets. So overall, technologically, Japan is superb. They are the most advanced nation in the world in terms of technology. So, and, and if they did want to become a nuclear power, I can assure you that they can, if they want, come up and build a working prototype of a nuclear weapon by next week. That's how good they are. So their technological capability is not in doubt. Now, we also have to understand the political geopolitical situation when it comes to Japan. Japan is a US captive state. Japan is under permanent US military occupation and this situation has persisted since 1945, since the Japanese surrender to the US at the end of the Second World War. And Japan's constitution, specifically Article 9, says that Japan forever renounces war as a sovereign right of the Japanese nation. So Japan's economic policies, uh, military policies, and to a large extent, the foreign policy also of Japan is essentially controlled and dictated by the US. It may not be apparent to the untrained eye, but that is indeed the case. Now, Japan does have a small military, the Japan Self-Defense Force, the JSDF, and they also, let's say, benefit from the protection of the US occupation forces in Japan, the United States Forces Japan that are headquartered at Yokota Air Base in Tokyo. And Japan also benefits from the protection of the US nuclear umbrella. So the Americans have a massive military presence in Japan thousands of soldiers, tens of thousands of soldiers. They, they have more than 130 permanent bases or more or less permanent bases all across Japan. About 75% of these are in Okinawa. So Japan does benefit from the protection that this gives them. Now, what are the threats that Japan faces in its neighborhood? I and mean, we're talking about Japan possibly going nuclear. What threats does it face? The first threat is North Korea. So Japan and North Korea aren't uh, on very good terms. And North Korea is the only nation in the 21st century that has conducted nuclear tests in violation of the global moratorium. They have conducted at least six nuclear tests, including tests of thermonuclear weapons, which are fission fusion reactions, thermonuclear, they're called hydrogen bombs in, in some parlance. And the North Koreans have possibly succeeded in miniaturizing their warheads. They have conducted multiple tests of various kinds of missiles, ballistic missiles. They, their most capable missile is an ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile, which can cover all of the the US. That's how far it can reach their most capable and long range missile. And it's not known whether these missiles have MIRV capability, which allows a single missile to carry multiple warheads that can be independently targeted. But the Koreans, North Koreans have excellent missile capabilities and they have possibly miniaturized their nuclear warheads. Now, North Korea is essentially a proxy of China. It's controlled by China. It's heavily dependent on China. And you could say it's a vassal of China. 
So it's the good old good cop, bad cop routine. The Chinese don't want to take certain actions because it would affect their international standing. So they have, they, they have North Korea do those things for them. So the Chinese act as the good cop and the North Koreans act as the bad cop, but they are on the same team. So that is the situation. Now, when it comes to nuclear weapons in this region, the Americans had nuclear weapons stationed in South Korea, but they withdrew them in 1991. 1991 was the beginning of the unipolar moment of the US. The USSR had disintegrated and the Americans imagined that there was no threat for them left in the world. So they withdrew the, the nuclear weapons from South Korea in 1991. And that unipolar moment lasted a couple of decades. But then in the 2010s, you had the rise of China as a major threat to the US. And now we have a resurgent Russia as well. So the situation has changed. So one threat for, for Japan is North Korea. The other threat is China. Uh, the relations between the two nations are unfriendly at the best of times, and they have a territorial dispute. The Senkaku Islands that are in the vicinity of Taiwan, they are close to Taiwan. And uh, the Chinese claim that these are Chinese islands. They call them the Diaoyu Islands. And there are about a, about a couple of dozen Chinese military bases within a range of the Senkaku Islands. The Chinese routinely, routinely transgress into Japanese territorial waters and they conduct over flights with aircraft of these islands, again in contravention of uh, Japanese airspace, but they claim that these islands belong to them. So the Chinese have this situation with almost all of their neighbors. They claim territory of almost all of their neighbors. The Chinese are a hegemonic expansionist nation. They have this imperialistic tendency. They don't want friends, they want to bully everyone. India knows this very well, and I'm not going to go into that situation. But yeah, so so China's China's rise, which they call China's peaceful rise, is not peaceful by any means. Every single nation in China's neighborhood feels threatened by China, and with good reason. There's good reason for that. So that is a situation, and the Chinese conduct this routine barrage of propaganda, not just against India, but also against Japan. The Global Times keeps on uh, attacking Japan, uh, the Global Times is a Chinese propaganda mouthpiece. Recently, they put out this tweet, which uh, characterizes the US-Japan alliance as an axis of evil. So Japan's second large threat is China. Now, one cannot imagine when, uh, conceivably that uh, Japan and China would go to war over the Diaoyu or the Senkaku Islands. Let's say the Chinese capture those islands. Let's say hypothetically that happens. Then there's nothing left. There's no dispute left between Japan and China, unless the Japan, J the Japanese try and retake those islands, in which case there could be a limited war. But the real problem is that Japan is a US fortress. So in case of a hypothetical future US-China war, Japan is going to be very much in China's crosshairs. And that is the real issue. So that's why China is a threat because of the massive US presence on Japanese soil. The third threat for Japan is Russia. Now, Russia does exist in this region, in the, the far east of, of, of Russia. And Japan and Russia have this territorial dispute as well. The Kuril Islands dispute, which dates back, I mean, the dispute goes back in time, but let's talk about 1945. So the Japanese and the USSR had this non-aggression pact during the Second World War. Now, after the Hiroshima bombing, the Soviets broke the pact and they went ahead and captured the Kuril Islands, uh, which were Japanese territory, at least some of them were Japanese territory. The Soviets went ahead and captured these islands. And because Japan was reeling from the nuclear bombing in Hiroshima and soon after Nagasaki also happened, so they could do nothing about this. And then they were, they were, they, they surrendered to the US. So the Japanese and the Soviets never signed an official ceasefire. And after the USSR disintegrated, its successor state, Russia, and Japan also did not ever sign a ceasefire. So technically, World War II is still on between Japan and Russia. So Japan demands that these that the, the Russians give these islands back. The, the Russians obviously have been refusing and relations between Japan and Russia aren't good. They are strained because of this territorial dispute. And these Kuril Islands, they are extremely important strategically. Uh, the, the Russian Pacific Fleet is based near Vladivostok. And whenever it wants to sail out into the open seas of the Pacific, it typically goes through the Kuril Islands. And because 
the Americans have such a massive presence in Japan, all these activities of the Russian fleet are closely monitored. And that is something that grates on the Russians. So there is that situation there. So Japan and Russia also, again, do not have good relations. And Russia is a threat from the Japanese perspective. So these are the three main threats for Japan. One is North Korea, one is China, and one is Russia. All three are nuclear armed nations. Now, today we are experiencing a very, very profoundly altered global geopolitical situation. China is very strong. Of course, China's economic growth isn't what it used to be. It's, it's slowing down. It is indeed slowing down. And China is, is facing the prospect of an impending demographic disaster. Its total fertility rate has dropped drastically, abysmally. It was 1.1 or even less than that in last I saw. And it's projected that, that by, 20, um, by 2100, China's population will be half of what it is today. And the average age will be in the 60s. So it's going to be a very old nation. They're going to grow old before they grow rich. So that is the long term situation that China faces. But as of today, it's still a very powerful nation and that decline will not become apparent for a decade or two. So right now, China is a huge threat for Japan. Russia itself is resurgent and that is also a problem for, for, for Japan. So two out of the three most powerful nations in the world are in Japan's backyard and three of three if you include the US, which is entrenched within Japan. And Japan has territorial disputes with these two of three most powerful nations. So if you want to talk about the most powerful nations in the world, take a look at this chart. This is, these are the top 10. This is a, an index that I have created and calculated. I'm going to be releasing this very soon. If you want to understand how this was calculated, take a look at my course. The link is in the description below. Once again, let me remind you that it is the US that controls Japan and as such, the US controls Japan's destiny. So whatever happens, whatever Japan does, it's actually going to be decided by the US. If Japan does go nuclear, it's going to be a US, an American decision. Now, from the American perspective, they are facing the prospect of a resurgent Russia. And for them, for the Americans, it makes sense to give Russia a new headache to deal with. So right now, Russia, all of its focus is in Ukraine and uh, mostly on Ukraine. Now, if a new nuclear armed nation suddenly emerges in Russia's Far East, it's going to be something the Russians will have to address and address very, very seriously. So that would be a problem for Russia. So they would be forced to divide their focus, divide their attention, divide their efforts, divide their energy in two places. So it makes sense for the Americans, logically. To, to, you know, give them the prospect of a new nuclear uh, power in their Far East. And also, if Japan becomes a nuclear power, then China will also face a new headache. The entire geopolitical nuclear calculus in the region will be upended. China will have to reconsider and revise its nuclear doctrine. And China will also have to increase the size of its nuclear arsenal. Let's say Japan acquires 100 nuclear warheads or 200, let's say. That would totally upend the strategic calculus in the region. And the Chinese will have to consequently um, increase the size of their nuclear arsenal as well. So that could significantly complicate matters over here. So if Japan does go nuclear, it's going to be a US decision, not a Japanese decision. Now, how could Japan go nuclear? One scenario is that Japan develops its own nuclear weapons. It tests those nuclear weapons and then develops and tests missiles. And these missiles would need to be intermediate range ballistic missiles because Moscow, from Japan's perspective, would need to be within range of these missiles. But now when it comes to developing nuclear weapons and developing missiles and testing them, that's a long drawn out process. Japan is an extremely advanced technological power. They can build a nuclear warhead, a prototype by next week, let's say, but they would need to test these warheads. Now, testing is a taboo. It's a big taboo. It's a big no-no in the world right now. And uh, testing nuclear weapons, I mean, the last French nuclear test was in 1996. The last Indian test was in 98. And 
North Korea is the only nation to have tested nuclear weapons in the 21st century. And that's kind of why the Western world regards North Korea as kind of a rogue nation. So if Japan was to were to break that nuclear moratorium, the taboo, it would not be received well anywhere in the world. So then the other alternative is that the Americans simply loan Japan nuclear weapons and missiles. And that would ensure that they are in full control of this nuclear arsenal that Japan uh, is given. Right. So these are the two scenarios. They either develop this on their own and test it or they simply acquire it from the US on loan. And it becomes kind of a you know shared nuclear arsenal, that kind of thing. Uh, now, what type of nuclear deterrent could J Japan possibly acquire? There are three types of nuclear deterrents, de deterrents land-based, air-based, and sea-based. A land-based deterrent is typically nuclear missiles that are stored in silos underground and launched whenever required. Now, Japan is a highly densely populated nation, so it would be very hard to hide those nuclear storage sites. And if the, if the location is known, then it becomes an easy target for a first strike. So a land-based deterrent seems to be out of the question, then you could have an air-based deterrent for which you would need strategic bombers. And that too is kind of problematic. So the third option, the submarine-based nuclear deterrent, seems to be the most logical option for Japan. So Japan has ex excellent submarines. They could use three to five ballistic missile submarines. At least one should be on patrol at all times. Each submarine would have 16 missiles, let's say. Each missile would have, let's say, four warheads per, per missile. And each warhead would have about a 100 kiloton yield. So that's 64 missiles per submarine. And if you have five of those, that's quite a big number, but you can, you know, play around with the numbers. So that's the kind of uh, deterrent Japan could have. Now, if Japan does acquire nuclear weapons, either on its own or through US help, then the reaction is going to be significant. China will be furious, Russia will be furious, North Korea will be furious, even South Korea will be furious because South Korea and Japan also don't have good relations. And that dates back to the Japanese actions during the Second World War. So if South Korea is furious, the Americans may be tempted to give even South Korea a nuclear deterrent. So that's the kind of situation that could happen. So once again, we are in the midst of a rapidly evolving geopolitical scenario in the world. The kind of world we were living in 10 years ago, it's gone. Today, it's very different. Uh, new powers are, are emerging. Uh, some powers are resurgent like China and Russia. And the Americans want to retain their primacy, retain their top dog status as the sole superpower in the world. And they would be tempted, I would say, to allow Japan to go nuclear. So if Japan does go nuclear, once again, it's going to be an American decision, not a Japanese decision. And why five years? Because now is the time to do it, because there is a resurgent Russia, which is a significant threat to the US. And in five years, the world will be very different. And a nuclear Japan, which would be very much under their control, would be a great trump card for them. So that's what the situation is all about. Kissinger said that Japan could go nuclear within five years, which gives us an end date of 2028. If you are a betting person, knowing Kissinger and his understanding of the world, I think it would be a reasonably good bet that, nu that Japan could go nuclear by 2028. So that is the situation. That's what this is all about. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.